So it's really great to be here with Michael. We haven't seen each other for quite a while. Yeah, it's been a long time. I don't know. It's probably been about a year at least. It's yeah, I'm thinking you've been busy with family and <clears throat> children, child, son. So um, the reason that we're getting together today is um, maybe threefold. I don't know. We have a lot of things to talk about. But the thing that was on my mind was that I earlier in the week, I sent you a video from James Lindsay where he's talking about the title of the video was the negating of the real, which I thought was the most important, interesting part of mm -hmm. the talk. Um, talk was a lengthy talk and he went into a lot of detail and um, I wanted to get your take on it because there were a few things in it that were um, quite concerning to me. It, it's a little, when you hear someone lay something out like that and he's got like all his ducks in a row, <clears throat> It can be very compelling to listen to, but all the time you have to be telling yourself every conspiracy theory is like that, where everybody mm -hmm. gets all their ducks in a row and it gets all very tight and neat. And uh, but I mean, he's not really talking about a conspiracy theory so much as he is talking about a group of people who all think the same way. But in the end, it it did. Um, he did go down a path that linked in a lot of things that maybe he didn't have very good understanding of. And so um, there's a whole list of things that he hooks together. I think you, you actually did at one point, write it out in your. Yeah. Okay. So he has all, he has together um, CRT, postmodernism, Marxism, Hegel, Kabbalah, Illuminati, Rosicrucianism, Hermeticism, and Gnosticism. And he's got all of them linked together yeah. in this tight chain, um, indicating that they are all coming from the same source. And um, so I wondered if you might like to talk about that a bit. Yeah, it was, um, I don't know, it was very much unlike most of the other um, interactions I've seen with him. Because he, I mean, he's, he's a super intelligent person. Um, I don't, I don't like really keep up or follow him it's, it's funny like it, it, he was one of those people um back in the day that i i spent you know a fair amount of time listening to because I, I think he had some he was one of the folks that came out with that what was it um what was the term where they were submitting all those fake papers to journals and demonstrating yes. how corrupt the process was if you just yeah. played a certain word game with um you could get almost anything submitted like there was something about like I think it was like, like, um, how something with dog parks and, you know, um, I can't, I can't remember all the details, but like there, there was like, they took some language from Mein Kampf and submitted it and just changed some of the words around with the Jews to something about the, the patriarchy or something like a bunch of stuff like that. So, but, and so he, um, and he usually is very, he's, he's obviously has a very academic background and he's very comfortable in those fears. So he, he's has this sort of drive to understand what's going on with all this, um, you know, critical race theory and, and post Marxist, uh, um, postmodern like philosophy, et cetera, like what's driving it and, and the sort of, um, some of the nonsense that can come out of it where you have words that have really no definition other than as a sort of, uh, label for your opponent's ideas and and um he, he does he does a, a fairly good job of showcasing that um in in a lot of his work but this it felt like it was something very different like um he was like he like i mentioned he he kind of does a word salad of pushing all these things together and there's probably links you can make between those things but first of all he doesn't make the connection he just kind of mentions them and he'll he'll like mention like Oh, this word, you know, uh, hermeticism comes from the Greek god Hermes. And uh, there's, you know, did you know that in the this this ancient myth, this the god Hermes did this? And it's like, like, okay, but there was never like a I don't know, it wasn't like a a serious gene genealogical survey of the ideas and how they connected to and influenced one another. So um it, yeah, it, it felt like he was just kind of off the rails in terms of his understanding of these things. I I think we, you know, as you mentioned, like 
the idea that there is some sort of attack against the real. And I think he he talks about some of the ideas. Uh, I think it's a French guy. I can't ever say his name right. Baudrillard. He talks about the, the idea of this simulacrum and this sort of like layering of like abstractions on one another to to the point where you kind of lose touch with the real, like you're in this, this sort of fake world of ideas. Um, I think that's that, that idea in itself is very interesting. Um, and I think we're certainly approaching that. Well, let's, um, let's touch on that. Let's start with that idea. Um, because the name of the conference that they were doing was mere simulacrity, which was a yeah. take on mere Christianity. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't okay. It was one, one of the other talks they made that connection explicit or um i i think that it might have been one of the other talks i didn't listen to, in length to any of the other talks but i might have heard like the first minute or something of some introduction or something but anyway they did mention that that mere simulacrity was a take on mere christianity as in other words that the simulacrity is the opposite of christianity because it's um it's a creating a world that is not real whether that's a virtual simulacrity or whether it's a, a simulacrity of abstractions. Um, mm -hmm. But so let's take a look at that idea. Um, the fundamental idea underlying all of this stuff is this idea of not that. Mm -hmm. And, and basically what he means by that is someone can always get you if, if, whatever you are is not what you should be. And yes, I'm not what I should be. <laughs> but then, you know, what goal do I work towards? Well, you know, anything that I work towards is still going to be for them, not that. Nothing that you do is ever going to be good enough. It's always not that because um, the, like, America, not that we don't want, we don't want anything about America. Not that we want something else. Well, what do you want? Well, you know, we'll figure that out after we get rid of, yeah, <laughs> we get rid of this problem. <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it, it was, the whole conversation was interesting. Cause he's, I, I, I surmised by looking at just briefly watching some of the other videos in the series that the, the whole conference is, was at being held at a church. And I think one of the, at least one of the other um, speakers was an, was a minister um, of, of sorts. Um, so he, his Actually, audience. It's is, a, that organization is an organization that Jordan Peterson had spoken at before. Okay. What's it, what's it called? The organization called? Sovereign Nation. Yeah. I n didn't recognize that. Um, and um, yeah, so it's, but what's interesting is is um, so it felt like James Lindsay was. I know he he seems to see that Christians are an ally against some of the the nonsense coming out of the uh, the academy right now, and and so. But I, I I don't know. Like he, in terms of any conversations I've ever seen with him, he doesn't have any metaphysical commitments of his own, like about like what is real. Like I feel like, which is. And from my perspective, puts him in a perspective where he's still in that stuck in that psycho critique himself, where he's just saying not that to the CRT stuff. Like he's saying it's, you know, he, he's just making a critique of the critique, um, which I think his critique is rather compelling in a lot of senses. But um, it doesn't I think what we're what we need to have some sort of signpost back to the real is some better definition of what that is and how we know we're in contact with it, which um, I, I, he doesn't, he seems to be lacking. Well, so when he starts with Gnosticism and there's a lot of debate about what Gnosticism actually is and, and mm -hmm. how much of Gnosticism has is good or bad and how much has crept into the church or not. And um my own understanding of Gnosticism is about a half an inch deep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've always just thought that Gnosticism was basically the idea that people who are involved in a Gnostic mindset have, I've got the secret knowledge and yep. my group has the secret knowledge and we know something that you don't know, which, so that seems to me like that would be very toxic if that got into Christianity because Christianity needs to scale for people of every mental capacity and every age and, and 
and all of that. So, but what else is there about Gnosticism? Is there, are there people who are holding views that could roughly be called Gnosticism that are within traditional Christianity? Yeah, well, I mean, it's definitely something that's been with the church since the beginning. And again, I think definitionally, it's it's difficult for us to talk about it. Because um, I've heard there's people today that call themselves Gnostics that like actually have things in, and their definition of, of that word is completely different in terms of like the, the gnosis or the knowledge they're talking about isn't, isn't a propositional sort of knowledge. You know, it's a, it's the sort of knowledge that could only be transmitted from one person to another in, in a kind of a relational aspect. Right. So, which is, which is completely different than um, some of the, I th I think, because we're all, in some sense, both children of the Enlightenment and children of the Protestant Reformation, which I would say is still, we're still right in the middle of. We don't really recognize that, but like um, nothing in the, um, in the political and, um, you know, kind of religious landscape of today would make sense if you can't, if, if you don't really understand the Protestant Reformation and kind of the, the, the forces it unleashed in terms of uh this possibility for uh, a sort of splintering of of uh you know kind of worldviews and in ways of of um of redefining what is most fundamental um that which again I, I don't know how to to think about that because i i think you know you can you make the argument that there's a lot of positive things that came into the protestant information in terms of um uh, abuses within um the the church and and so forth that needed to be addressed um and I, I do think it it does it opens up a, a place for individuals to have more of a voice um and more of an impact um it, I, I think our you know our modern concept of a quote unquote genius couldn't have come about without the Protestant Reformation because it does, it, it 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 opens up something that's of supreme importance about even an individual person, um, which I don't think conceptually was really in um, in the mind of folks. Like so, even like you know the founding of this country, where we tried to take human rights in a in a more serious way, I think has it needs some of that sort of uh, definitional. Uh, foundational like thinking about um the value of the individual that comes i think comes out of the protestant reformation and and um you know where luther is saying hey you know i have to follow my conscience and do this thing you know even though it's it's you know i'm i'm a i'm a catholic monk and you know all i i believe in this tradition that i'm a part of but i i see that it's failing and i have to kind of like stand up to it and um that i think that's a good thing that that sort of idea has been introduced but at the same time it's it's introduced a world now where um a lot of people their moral high ground comes about through critique like and critique is really easy because like for instance like it it, it doesn't matter what you're looking at there's something to critique like i you know we could go through and watch you know pick a YouTube channel like yours or anybody's and go just, let's just go watch hours of their videos and find all the things they said something wrong. Um, they said something that might, you know, and, and then we, we, we hold up that critique as sort of emblematic of who they are. That's, I mean, that that's a lot of what happens nowadays. Uh, and it's, it's something that people see other people doing. So they copy it themselves. Um, and there's a lot of power in it because like, you aren't putting forth a positive view of the way things should be that could be criticized. Like you, you're, you're maintaining this very small surface area of what you can be criticized for. And like, um, and I, I feel like that's, that's really what um, CRT has found and it is, it's become the sort of mind virus where it doesn't like, you can't define any of the terms it uses and so it, it has, there's nothing that can be attacked in it other than that, you know, it doesn't work um, um, in terms of creating a, a structure or like a, a, a some sort of 
solution to the problems it, it addresses um, other than to say, you know, let's tear down what exists. Um, my and- dad used my dad used to talk about that all the time back in the 60s when I was in high school and then college. Um, when the riots were going on in 68, you know, these people just want to tear everything down, but they've got nothing to put in its place. <laughs> So, I mean, that kind of thing has been going on for a long time. But um, one thought that occurred to me when you were talking about the Reformation and the way that it kind of created this opportunity for an individual and for an individual to take a stand. But so there's a needle that gets has to get threaded there where. This is why I think there has to be there has to be a, a connection higher up between people. So that if you're going to be individuals, you all have to have a, a common um, a common center, a common, you know, unity towards which you look as a people. Maybe theoretically it's possible if it's only an idea, like the American ideal or something. But mm-hmm. but I think it's it's much better, of course, if it's God, because then we have we have this common framework. But if you don't have that, then what happens is this splintering off, which creates a lot of individuals who are, can be easily manipulated into believing, oh, we have to take a stand about this. And then they all get together with this stand. It turns into this mob mentality, like in the French Revolution or in the Hutsus and Tutsis, you know, um, with the two mobs going at each other every one of them thinking that they're an individual taking a stand for something that's vitally important. Mm-hmm. I wonder if that kind of thing happened before the Reformation. I mean, I know there were wars, but weren't those wars mainly because of whoever was the dictator or the monarch or whatever in leadership, getting people to fight underneath him against somebody else? Or were they this kind of masses of people going at each other? Yeah. I, I think it's there definitely was I mean the individual still had an impact like before the Protestant Inform- Reformation but it was like as it, to have that impact you had to be like a, a sort of great you had to be like a hero you had to be kind of larger than life uh, like a you know like an a Alexander, John Arc. yeah Alexander the Great or um, well I think it, Joan, Joan of Arc even is starting to move into this other tradition where it's like it's 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 the little person it's the Mm -hmm. it's the person that nobody is not in the seat of authority that suddenly can have a voice that is that has an outsized impact because it's it's aligned to something true you know um because i mean you you look at like you know luther's critiques of the catholic church i mean like i think we'd all agree today like most of them were pretty spot on like there's probably things that he got wrong but there was a lot of a lot of the critiques that probably uh, were 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 landed pretty well because people, you know, they resonated. They, there was a sort of ring of truth to them. Um, it's just, um, I think now again, we just that that movement of protest is um, something that we now associate with. It seems like the only thing, like if you're a young person, it's like it feels like the only thing that you have available to you to to kind of have a a sort of sense of um, moral a moral compass is to to, to engage that behavior. Um, we don't have a sense of um, I don't know, like you said, there's not a when we talk about like trying to unite around something, like there's there isn't a common set of even definitional um ideas like even if we even if we use the same words people's meanings attached to those words have so been altered um by their tribal boundaries um in recent times so that's that you know we like in a single news story you know you you have these different narratives that get formed around you know who's the good guy and the bad guy in the story that drastically reformulates in, in people's interpretation of what actually happened it's which is it's kind of a crazy sort of madness i mean i think that i mean those those sorts of things i mean there's always a sort of disconnect between narrative and the underground facts that are are told but it, it's it's weird to have 
I don't know. Um, we're in this sort of kind of tower bubble moment where we somehow have created a, you know, a civilization that's really, really large um, and, and kind of dangerous. Cause in a certain sense, this Western civilization has become global to a large degree, especially um, over the last 20 years and the ways in which, um, you know, uh, these ideas have, have economically joined the globe together. Um, so, well, I mean that, you know, that that's been, um, there's been a push for that for much longer than 20 years. The whole, um, globalism thing has, was something I became aware of back in 1908, 1978, but that's just when I started to wake up and I started to see it. So, I mean, there's been a push for globalism for a long time and, and the, the education system began to push towards creating global citizens back in 1980. Mm -hmm. I did all this research. I had, I could see it in the textbooks. I could see it in the think tanks coming up with that language. We want to produce, we want education that produces good global citizens. So, I mean, this has been around for a long time, this global push. And that was one of the compelling things that James Lindsay was talking about was this mindset of the people at Davos. Cause the mindset that they have is we're taking a stand for something vitally important, which is the future of humanity. And, and, um, and we know what the right thing is, you know, at the beginning, he starts, he starts the lecture in kind of a weird way where he says, mm -hmm. you know, imagine yourself as somebody who thinks that you have the answer to what has to happen in order to save the world. And I think he was talking about that elite mindset that's at Davos. <clears throat> yeah. It would have been nice if he made it more explicit because a, a <laughs> yes. lot of it didn't make sense to me what he was trying yeah. to do. It, and then he, he goes on throughout the whole talk talking about this. There's a special language that, that people who are of that mindset, a special way that they have developed language so that words have a certain meaning. <clears throat> I think in your email to me, you called it dog whistles. Yeah, well, I was, <laughs> I was saying he's, he's kind of, I feel like, yeah, it, that's 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 the thing that the CRT folks accuse. It, it's a way of saying there was racism here, even though nobody said a racist word per yeah. se. There there was some hidden implication in what they were saying that was intended as a, a sort of secret signal to the other, you know, to to, mm -hmm. to maintain those racist <clears throat> systems and keep them like in power and like like kind of wink at everybody and let them know, hey, we're all on the same side. We we want to keep these these racist systems going um where and he, he and i don't know if he if he is aware of this but he was kind of starting he was doing that same thing he's like these people are using these which when you do that like you're, you're kind of i think the whole argument falls apart to some extent because you're basically saying this is something this is a conscious choice people are making to kind of like do this sort of wink and nod i don't from my perspective a lot of people I'm sure there are some people out there that have like are completely, you know, psychopathic and sociopath and like they just see these kind of systems and the way certain language games are being played and they're playing them. They're like, oh, if I say X, Y and Z, you know, everybody falls over themselves and I get friends and, you know, accolades, et cetera, um, to people do what I want. Or there is a, a certain power I have if I use a certain word and call somebody a certain word and how they they react to that. But I think for most people, they're 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 sort of it's it's much more unconscious, and they're they're. I, this is another critique of James Lindsay because he talks about things like satanic and so forth, but he doesn't. I don't think he has a metaphysic that says there's actual spiritual realities that could be influencing people, and they are the real masterminds rather than uh, the people um, we're talking about. But it it always it plays so much more well in our imagination when we we're. we're, we're we want the bad guy to be over there, you know, because it helps rally our <clears throat> tribe to get, you know, to get action going, to get, you know, whatever, whatever it is we're trying to achieve. Like, and I'm not even sure, like, like, what was he trying to achieve in that? I, I have no idea other than to say there's bad guys out there and they're over here. And uh, well, I think it all comes down to this whole thing of, okay, so fear versus faith, first of all. And then, as you were saying, looking at the bad guys as being over there. So, so this morning, before we got on, I was just reading this. Um, 
this wonderful Bible that was put out by Word on Fire. Uh -huh. It it has the text of the Bible, but then it also has some like little commentaries here and there. And so there is one from Hans Urs von Balthasar, who we had mentioned in our emailing. And it's he wrote this little commentary on Revelation chapter 18, which is the one about um, Babylon, the horror of all the earth and mm -hmm. the destruction of Babylon. <clears throat> and he says, I think this is just such an amazing quote. Um, the kingdom of God will never be externally demonstrable. It grows invisibly perpendicular to world history. Man responds to this provocation by attempting to manufacture the kingdom of God on earth. Now that's the Davos people. They're mm -hmm. attempting to manufacture the kingdom of God on earth. They've got a utopian vision for what they think is right. But, but even that utopian oh, hold vision. On. Yeah, let me, let right. me finish here. Okay. <clears throat> With increasing means and methods of power, Logically, this power that resists the powerlessness of the cross is bound to destroy itself, for it bears the principle of self-annihilation within it by saying no to the claim of Christ. So basically, I think what von Balthasar is saying is that we are Davos. Every one of us is Davos mm -hmm. because we bear... If we say no to Christ, we bear self-annihilation within ourselves because anytime we try to manufacture the kingdom of God for ourselves, anytime we try to um, fix our own problems without looking to God for that help by drugs or food or shopping or, you know, anything that we do that is going to create our own little utopia so that we don't have to depend on God. We're just like Davos. So so mm -hmm. it, Davos becomes this easy enemy over there of all of these elites that are going to destroy the world. And the reason that's so dangerous, it's very convenient because it gives, it creates fear, just like COVID created fear in people. And when you create fear, then people are much more manipulable. So if you can create a lot of fear about the people in Davos and and have conferences and get everybody all riled up, then um, you you don't you may not even realize what you're doing, and that you're creating a very manipulable population mm -hmm. by doing that, and that's the part that I think is very concerning to me. Yeah. Well, I was I was going to say too, like the, the whole I, the the whole utopianism that the Davos people have is itself a Christian idea. Like it wouldn't, it wouldn't make sense otherwise. Um, it wasn't like, but it's, it's, it's just gone off the rails because the metaphysics, the metaphysical component has been taken out and it's, it is, and that leaves, there is no, there is no real to appeal to. There's only instrumental uses of language and power and to achieve some ends because there is, there's no ultimate um you know ruler or measure of 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 truth goodness and beauty those those things are just kind of what we decide them to be um and i do think i do think that's something we've we've lost is um is the ability to talk about those things and also the fact that those things are actually a union rather than separate things truth goodness and beauty you know largely speaking, you could, um, you could say, you know, truth is aligned to the, the scientific endeavor and, you know, religion is aligned to the pursuit of the good. And, and, you know, the artistic community is, is, is uh, pursuing beauty in some form, but like those things in our imagination are completely sundered from one another. Um, and I think the union of those is what allows us to, is, is what, invites us into the real and, and gives us a, a, a um it gives us a bulwark against um this simulacrum this this sort of um 
this sort of uh, fear-based approach you were talking about. You know, I one thing that was occurring to me when I was thinking about this, um, my son, we were we were talking about him before we got on. He when he was really young, he uh, he had this condition called pyloric stenosis. It's it's kind of rare. You don't often hear about it because um, it's uh, you have this surgery when the kids are really young, and it it just the surgery fixes it. But it's it, the, the difficulty is often getting it diagnosed. And oftentimes you go through a process where it's it's misdiagnosed or missed. And then like the, uh, essentially what happens in the, in the process, the kid is not getting any nutrition because there's this little muscle in their stomach that like seizes up and they're not getting any food. They're basically throwing up all their food. And, um, and my son during that period, like, you know, he was part of probably why it went further than it should have in terms of being diagnosed because like, he was pretty like he pretty laid back like he he wasn't like i look back at the pictures now and i could see how distressed he was um but the other thing is too like whenever he was upset if i took him outside he would he would calm down immediately and i've been thinking about that too because i like this this connection to the real is it's also about the this sort of presence of god within the natural world and there is something about when we we kind of remove, we get away from the objects that we've created and, and are looking at nature in some, you know, more uh, unfiltered or unmediated form that like we do, like there is a, a, a phenomenological felt reality of, of um, something larger than ourselves in a, in a sort of sense that, um, yeah, I don't know what's going on, but it seems like there is uh, an intelligence and a design that supersedes all of that, that I'm a part of, and that I belong to, that you can, I, I think you have this, an experience of, you know, when you're in nature. And I think that's, you know, for my son, even as young as he was, like he, he immediately had a sense of like, everything's okay, even though I'm in pain. Um, just, just, um, just through that connection, I think uh, I'm the point I'm trying to make it is that we we have I don't know we we have all these layers that is, so so I, for that perspective I think James is exactly right that we're we're bringing all these layers of propositional abstract ideas that we surround ourselves with and we we kind of joust with them in these digital spaces but the, that's it's completely we've lost a sort of sense of um, of what we really are in terms of we're not just um, ideas, but we also like our bodies and, and, and our um, realities around us are just as, as equal as important as all these things. And we, we, we don't, we, we have a difficult time connecting those things right now. And we're um, things like the, the lockdowns and um, the isolation from each other is, it's kind of, definitely furthered that and makes it it makes it even harder to have a sense um of uh of the real to countervail these this these these crazy ideas that we're you know going around you know one of the things that jordan peterson always says is that um the in his in his mindset in his metaphysic the the most real is um pain and suffering that that that's when you that's when you get in touch with the real basically um let me play this little clip for you i think this is pretty amazing um if you want an antidote if you want an antidote on the other side from uh, <clears throat> getting frightened by james Lindsay's thing you can watch this thing here this is os guinness he's one of the guys that is part of the Exodus seminar with Jordan Peterson on okay. CW plus and Oz Guinness is probably 80 years old. Now he grew up in China. His parents were born in China and his grandparents were missionaries in China. So his grandparents were missionaries in China. His parents, I think might've been, I don't know if they were missionaries or just physicians in China, but they were physicians in China during and after the second world war so os guinness was about um 
six to nine years old or something like that in China during the, the great um, famines and the onset of the communists taking over China. So he lived through, as a child, he lived through the Japanese um, invasion into China and then the war and then the communists coming in. And he tells a little bit of this story here. And I'm just going to play a couple of minutes of this. Well, no, no great credit to me. I was very small in the famine. I was, I was three. So everything I know, I've heard others telling me. But as I said, five million died in three months. So there was almost no food. My mother was a surgeon. There was no medicine. There was cannibalism. There were people selling their children for an evening meal. People would go out into the fields and couples would embrace and just lie there and die. And five dead bodies all over the place. And then we went to the horror of the reign of terror under Mao. And it really was terrifying. But I would just say, uh, and Jenny knows my parents too. They've both gone to heaven now since. Never once did I ever see them waver in their faith. And the idea, uh, as my dad used to put it, God is greater than all. He can be trusted in all situations. Have faith in God. Have no fear. And I just watched him. I, I was only nine then. But I saw them. And I also saw the courage of Christians. And so we went to church, and I was a little kid, of course, and the sermons from half an hour, they go on for an hour, and then they began to go on for an hour and a half. And I said to my dad, what is this? This is so boring. <laughs> he said, remember, the communists are coming, and in a year or two, they'll have no teaching, and they'll have no fellowship. So they're just drinking up everything they can get. And then I remember the first day. Anyway, the whole thing is totally worth watching because um, he's talking about a couple of books that he has written. He's written many books, but um, just this, he tells the story of his life at the very beginning of the video. And then, then they discuss a lot of ideas. And then there's this little pit, bit at the at back end there that I was playing for you. But basically what I'm trying to say is we have no idea how bad things could be. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and if we let ourselves get all fearful about, the state of affairs now what's going to happen if it really gets bad <laughs> no um i liked what he said his his parents just said have faith and there's no reason to fear because god is bigger than all of this you know how do you hold on to that in the midst of i think where the needle that you have to thread is you have to hold on to that and at the same time you know like peterson is always saying it's so important to speak the truth or at least not to lie in the midst of a culture that's attempting to change the language so that you might be saying things that are truthful in the language, but someone else is hearing it through a completely different language because the, the meaning of words has been changed. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think, how, I think the, the whole, speak the, yeah, the whole, speak the truth thing is i think is is very very deep and um it's man I, I don't think anybody really takes that seriously because like we're, we're um we all have i think most people have they don't have they, there's more of a, a an instrumental idea of what truth is even you know that it, that they're um and i'd say the other thing that besides just truth that I think Jordan Peterson has a great perspective on is like just the idea of trying to clean up your room, you know, just as a sort of metaphor for not, not giving up on trying to have a positive effect to try and align your local uh, sphere of influence towards the true, the good and the beautiful, rather than to say, Oh, it's, you know, it's all going, you know, to hell in a handbasket here. So why bother? Um, you know, I, I can't, because I, I think that, you know, I, I, 
it, it's obvious that you know you have to have faith in 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 God ultimately um, resolving things. Um, but it seems like we also are invited to have some sort of impact on the on the story that we're in, right? And that um, I think those those are the two things that are hard to hold in in um, together because like it it can be. I, I've seen some people in their faith have a kind of mode of like, well, we prayed about it. So our, our work here is done, you know, and we just kind of stand back and watch. And there's a sort of, um, you know, I, I think prayer is, is necessary. Um, but it's, it's kind of like, it's, it's sort of, it's, it's definitely the things that, the actions that you undertake after having prayed about them are completely different than the actions where you don't. Um, but there's the action part is still necessary. And like you, um, you need to, to engage and you have to kind of, you have to put your own person on the line in terms of making your bets about, you know, what, what, uh, what sort of, uh, what is the true, the good, and the beautiful, and in and, and, and ways that um, other people can see? Because um, you know, we all have a, we all have some sort of limited capacity in terms of our ability to grasp these things. But there's something I think uh, that that is that transcends us, especially when we. Um, have this sort of vulnerability to, to, you know, to, to try and express these things in a way that, that, um, the others can see. And like, the, there's, there's, a I don't know, sort of opening of possibilities that happens, uh, when we do that. Um, um, and I do, I do think like, you know, in, in terms of like this little corner of the internet and all the, the, you know, the different relationships that have formed that it seems like a, a lot of what, what is happening is that sort of, um, breaking down of barriers and, um, and, uh, opening lines of communication, you know, and trust and an ability to say things that are difficult, or maybe, um, there may be some disagreement about, or even, you know, uh, all these reservations that you can't talk about a certain thing without there being some sort of confusion or, um, misunderstanding. So, um, yeah, I think continuing to do that. Cause I, like, I think it's gonna, it's, it, it probably is going to get a lot harder to do that at some points here. You know, like you said, if things, if things were to get, um, you know, kind of take a real left turn, um, then that, that uh like today like you know people's big fear is like getting canceled which isn't isn't nothing because people that are canceled can sometimes like lose their jobs they can lose you know real tangible things uh, that have like enormous benefit or, or enormous like impacts on their life but um yeah i mean it, that pointing back to where things have been like we're by and large we're still very blessed with um our ability to, um, you know, have, have some, uh, freedom to express ourselves. Well, in a way though, <clears throat> that may be, um, that may be where the danger lies because one of the things I appreciate about James Lindsay's talk is that if you don't know anything about what's going on, at least it wakes you up a little bit and says, wait a minute, because when when the Japanese went into China and started slaughtering people, it was very obvious what was happening. And then when the communists came in <clears throat> and took away everybody's freedom and took away everybody's um, capacity to take take care of themselves and to you know feed their families and everything else, and all, the starvation is going on everywhere, it's very obvious what's happening and where the enemy is. But in our world today, if you don't know. The, um, I think it's, what is Barry Weiss's newspaper called? Free Press? Free Press, I think. There was an article by another author on Free Press, um, either yesterday or today, talking about some of these people who have been canceled over not having the proper 
uh, response to the Black Lives Matter thing. Mm -hmm. And they weren't only canceled, they lost their, these were people in the arts, like dance troops and things like that. They lost all of their ability to get funding, to, um, to maintain their dance troops, to even be able to rent facilities for their exhibitions and so forth. Not because they were politically on the other side, but they wanted to take a politically neutral stand because they didn't mm-hmm. feel that art is political. But that that wasn't enough to be neutral. So they lost everything. And, and there's several stories in there. But that kind of thing, you don't even know if the thing you're doing is crossing the line. You don't know if the thing you're saying is wrong in, in that world. You don't know if the language you're using is wrong. And that's part of what, the communists were so good at doing in Soviet Russia was keeping people off uh, off guard all the time because they'd plant um, observers inside families and inside organizations so that you never knew if there was somebody listening to you or judging you and you never knew what their intentions were or what their motivations were. So um, if you don't know that kind of thing is going on, you can stumble into a minefield very easily. Um, yeah, but I, I was thinking back to back in the late seventies during the my kind of awakening that led me to Christ in nineteen eighty. The debate that was going on then in the Christian uh, world was that that there were a lot of people that were considered pietist. That basically, everything about the Christian life was. Um, be in community, pray, uh, love one another, take care of the sick, and and that that's your whole focus. And so you don't get involved in politics because that's the world. And then there were the other people coming in saying, no, if we don't get involved in politics, you know, our, our country is going to get taken from us. You know, there's the church is we're going to lose our freedom of religion and all that. So mm-hmm. then there's the political side. And And then there were the other people saying, well, yes, you can be a pietist, but still the Puritan work ethic is important. And the Puritan work ethic is what allowed people to make money in order to have money to give and to support missionaries Mm -hmm. and so forth. And then there's people on the other side saying, no, capitalism is wrong um, because it puts too much focus on the material thing. So you shouldn't be focusing so much on what you can make through working in the marketplace. And so even within the church, there's all this debate going on and was going on from the very beginning when I was first a new believer. So um, I can see why it's hard for people to make people from the outside looking in. It must be very hard for them to make sense of what's going on. Yeah, it's it's all very complex. And like, again, in any. I mean, at any large system, there's there's plenty to criticize all the time. and so the the question is, and this is is this kind of in some sense, um, I don't know, maybe a philosophical question. Like, to what degree you, you wonder, like, when you get systems of the size we have, to how you know it becomes it becomes difficult to to have any sort of like you know propositional improvements that don't have you know you know, passing a new law, they don't have unintended side effects. Right. And so, um, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, the, the big, a lot of the features of the American Republic that have allowed it to endure are just things that it did to try and limit the, the powers of all the, the different branches of government in many different ways in terms of like, you know, between the federal level and the state, and then the different branches of the federal authorities and so forth. Um, and I know a lot of a lot, it seems like a lot of some of that has been eroded over time. Um, but like, you know, we I, I don't like. I, I mean, democracy is still kind of this young thing in terms of, uh, you know, the history of the world um, and uh, how well it it works. Um, we don't know. I mean, it's uh, it maybe it works up to a certain scale, and then it uh, it starts breaking down. We gotta we gotta you know, um, rethink things again. Um, 
Well, I mean, that's exactly why the founders put in all those limits is because they knew that democracies always fail. So, so they, that's why they made it. Um, that's why they made the separation of powers and put in all the checks and balances so that there would be a protection against the failure of democracy because democracy is basically just 51 to 49, right? Yeah. So, so if you're a small minority, you have no hope whatever in a democracy. But in this country, minorities are protected and they're protected because of the separation of powers and, and all of that. I mean, all of this is the theory anyway. And what has happened is that um, the constitution was amended many times back in the early 1900s, 1913, 1916, 1970, some, sometime in there where a lot of those things that the founders put in place to make those separations and checks and balances powerful were stripped away. Mm -hmm. um, one of them being, for example, the direct election of senators prior to, I don't know if it was 1913 or 1917, whatever that amendment was, senators were elected by the legislatures, by the state legislatures, which meant that the decision-making was much closer to home much closer mm -hmm. to communities because you could you could elect your local representative to go to washington or, or to go to your state legislature and then those representatives together would make decisions about who the senator was going to be yeah and so they understood the needs of their state they understood the needs of their you know all the different constituencies within the state would negotiate with each other when they're electing the senator to make sure that they get a senator that's meeting all, you know, the farmer's needs and the, yeah. the city's needs and so forth. But then you go to direct election of senators. It's just direct democracy. Again, it takes away all of that protection that the founders had built in. So basically our Senate is no longer what it used to be. It used to be a place that puts the brakes on. Yeah. And that is more connected to the people back home. Interesting. Yeah, I, yeah. Never, I was never aware of that. There are a number of other things that happened like that. So um, I don't remember all the details right now. I was much more up on it years ago. But um, it's kind of like one of the reasons that everybody's against capitalism is because you can see what a mess it is right now. Yeah. But part of why it's such a mess right now is it's not, it's no longer anywhere near approaching a free market. I mean, capitalism, first of all, is a word that Marx came up with. So by, by even using the word, we're granting Marx this power to define what it is. But um, the actual free market, as it's laid out by um, Adam Smith, you know, the invisible hand kind of thing, is much closer to the idea that the distributed cognition of, of all the people is going to be much more powerful determiner of what products are needed and what price they should sell at and so forth. Mm -hmm. But then when you intervene in that with a lot of government rules and regulations and, you know, the government benefits some corporations over against others, it benefits some industries over against others by the way that they provide tax breaks and tax shelters and, yep. and all of that. So, we we haven't anything approaching a free market for decades, maybe hundred years in this country. I don't know. It's been a long time. Yeah, but, well, but the ever. system itself it probably I never has think, existed. Yeah, I don't think the system itself is toxic because it it is. You know, like some people say, it's the worst of all systems, except that it's better than every other system. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Because all the other systems also have within them, you know, we're stuck with sin. Mm -hmm. it, we're just stuck with it. So, but if you find a system that can, can rein it in and, and the free market in one sense reigns it in because my greed conquers your greed. So both of our greeds coming together, we have to, we have to butt up against each other with this um, opponent processing and find a way through. So maybe I want a million dollars for my house, but nobody's willing to pay me a million dollars for my house. So I have to yeah. wait to see what people are willing to pay. And in the end, we both get what we want. So. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely in, in that vein of, of saying that like, 
most of the time we aren't smart enough to make a lot of these complex decisions ourselves. So, you know, almost always like having some sort of distributed cognition as a means of solving it is going to get better results. I, I think that's fairly well borne out over the last, you know, you know, length of time that, that, I mean, it doesn't matter what the, the field is, um, you know, the, the, if, if there, if, you know, it was, whatever, somebody's taking two paths in one path, you know, they might have the worst solution, but they're iterating on it faster or like they're, they're running more experiments in terms of like where um, something, they almost always get ahead, right? Because even if this, this company over here has like the quote unquote best version of it. And like, you know, it's like late, it's supposedly the best of the best, but and it's all um, kind of top down um, integrated uh, it, that, that has a harder time kind of competing with all the the challenges. On the flip side, I do think, you know, we, we probably, we, we've gotten in this situation now where like we're in the worst of all possible worlds where, um, you know, we have a lot of organ like, um, large organizations or, um, corporations that have gotten, you know, close to monopoly powers. And then they use those monopoly powers to like buddy up to, uh, uh, folks in, in Washington. And they, they kind of help make sure that those, you know, they, they have allows them to keep those powers going. And, and so like, yeah, it's, and, and then the revolving door between, you know, industries, uh, like regulating bodies and then the, the industries that they're supposed to be regulating. Um, it's, it's very concerning. Like we obviously, I mean, it, like, I do think, you know, people have made, have made the observation that corporations um, under the law, they're treated almost like as a person and they, but they often have very psychopathic behaviors. If we looked at them, you know, like the amount of, of like money that pharmaceutical companies make, and then, you know, they, they do something that ends up killing a bunch of people. Um, and you, you look back and they, you know, you can see that they were negligent and people knew that they shouldn't have been doing this or should have been aware of some of the, the effects a drug was going to have, but they pushed it through with that greed. And then at the end of it, they pay some sort of fine, you know? So it's like, <laughs> is that really, is that really the level, does it produce the, enough of a disincentive to not do it again? You know? Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people said this about like, you know, the, the 2008 uh, financial crisis is like, you know, like a lot of these people probably should have gone to jail. Um, but it was, it was so hard to pinpoint like who is at fault because it was so widespread. Like, you know, you know, I'm, I'm doing this kind of deceptive thing because those guys are doing that deceptive thing. And like, there was a, just kind of chain of, of kind of like, don't ask, don't tell. We know this is pretty shady and it's a house of cards, but I'm going to make my buck while I can. And it was so widespread that it, you know, nearly collapsed the market. But even in, in instances where you found like a large organization was doing something like, you know, like a lot of the things that was going on was like, you know, the falsification of the data necessary collected for a mortgage and how it gets originated and like, you know, verifying somebody has a job and, you know, there's an income going to be able to pay back the, the mortgage and so forth. There's a lot of falsification that went into that. The people involved there, nobody ever went to jail. I mean, there was fines paid, but like, uh, like if, if, if I could go rob houses and I, I got caught and I just had to pay back some percentage of what I, you know, made robbing the houses, <laughs> um, that, that would never, that would make robbing houses a great business model. So it's like, um, we, we, well, and, we and, and the scary thing is that some of those things started to happen. I mean, they're going to happen anyway, because of the nature of greed, but but it was also kind of um, instigated in a in many ways by uh, a federal law that had come down saying that you have to provide certain opportunities to certain categories of, of uh, buyers, even if their income is not sufficient to pay back the loan. Mm -hmm. And so the banks trying to deal with that rule had to come up with some way to offload the risk from that category of buyers into other categories and so so they come up with these structures that they can use legally to manage their risk and so all this yeah. risk management turns into these securitized things and yeah 
Um, I was one of the things I was talk, thinking about back when you were talking about the, the big corporations, and of course, Fang comes immediately to mind. Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, and Google. When they first started growing and getting bigger and bigger, I remember people talking, and I was kind of in my in this camp myself. Why isn't anybody talking about monopoly here? Mm-hmm. And part of the reason nobody was talking about monopoly is that each of these companies was doing something kind of entirely new that had never been done before. And we were starting to look at them as sort of benefactors. You're providing us with this service and we get this service and it doesn't cost us any money. And so, um, and, and they're doing an excellent job of it. So we get this excellent service for no money and they just keep getting better and better. And so even if they are getting bigger and even if they now own half the property of where I live and all of that, you know, um, they were benefactors. And so nobody ever worried about them becoming monopolies. But now here they are so big and so powerful and we've all submitted ourselves to them. During COVID, I started buying almost everything from Amazon Mm-hmm. Well, that means that I'm not supporting the local vendors, the local stores, the local, you know, even local pharmacies and all that. If you if you get everything off of Amazon and then pretty soon Amazon owns the world. Now, yeah, they're very efficient. They do a great job and it's really easy to return things. But but we leave ourselves without any alternatives. Yeah. Right. And uh So what do you think about that whole thing of the monopolies? <laughs> yeah, I don't. You, you've probably got to go pretty soon, right? Yeah, I probably should. But um, I, I don't know. I mean, because it's. Um, yeah, it's. The problem is like. Things are moving so fast, you know. Yeah. Um, I, I think I think Google like like a lot of these monopolies. I think in the tech space, I'm okay with to some degree because I do think they're going to get disrupted. Like, I remember I was, this was man, I don't know how long this goes. I was I was applying for a job at Google, and I remember it just sort of hit me like because at the time Google was still like it was still like wasn't on anybody's radar. But like I could already see, like in terms of how, like it's it's already in the little growth that it experienced that it was going to be like, well, they're just everybody goes through this this cycle where like you you get to a certain size and then you you can't innovate, you know. And I think you know, Google maybe um, maybe at that place right now, for instance. So I, I think in a lot of cases, I, I'm not too worried. Like even Amazon, like you know, they 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 had a big surge during the uh, pandemic, but that they've gone down since. Um, they've um, doing some things like I, I feel like they've made their site their retail site a lot worse. There's a lot of articles that have come out about this recently because they're taking money. They're trying to build more of an advertising model for their business where they and you know so like a lot of people are paying money to advertise their stuff on their site and it makes the the quality of the experience for you or I a lot worse and that's going to make people go elsewhere. So it's like they're, they're making some money from it now, but it's like, I don't know. Um, yeah. I don't know. Like I, I, I'd like um, there to be stiffer regulation in a lot of industries, especially wall street, I think is one that really like um it, it's crazy to me how much people make money there and how much I think there are, I think there are real benefits that wall street brings to the economy overall, but a lot of it is just um, a lot of it is rent seeking and, and the ways in which those, a lot of org, like a lot of ways in which you get paid on wall street, like you circumvent the income tax uh, system. Cause you, the, you get this, it's kind of insane. Like I think uh, Warren Buffett pointed this out. He paid like a lower percentage on his income than his secretary does, which is 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 kind of crazy. Um, so I would like there to be more teeth for certain regulation uh, of industries, but then it's like, well, who do you? You got to create this thing that's way more powerful, and then like, who do you trust to have to wield that power? Like, do I trust? Uh, you know. <laughs> the politicians in Washington to uh, do that. You know, it's like, not really like, 
it's like it's it's um yeah it's it's really I don't know like I, I again I I keep coming back to this idea of the Tower of Babel because it's like we've tried to build these systems larger and larger and I just I don't know like I think they don't scale to a certain extent um so I think my um I think diminishing federal um you know control and giving more control back to states is a good thing overall and helping to kind of break that down and, and like have to to have us run more experiments on the way that um you know things should be run and then like if you don't like it you know and you live somewhere you can go elsewhere although i know it's never been harder than ever like it's it's you know P I saw an article about how like people are moving a lot less than they used to, but a lot of that's because just, I mean, the costs associated with it are so high, you know, like even just the transactions in real estate, you know, that, um, you know, housing is more expensive than ever. That 6% you pay to realtors is a bigger chunk of change than it's ever been. Um, it's, I don't know. It's. Well, going back to what you said about the 2008 crash and, and all of that, that could have never gotten so bad if people were speaking the truth. If people inside the system who were seeing what was happening were speaking the truth. Mm -hmm. um, we recently watched the the um, documentary on Madoff. Maybe I heard it, it's really maybe depressing. It was a mockumentary. Um, I, I can't remember if it was. Um, the one on uh, Netflix? Yeah, I, I think okay. they, they actually did dramatize it. There were some people playing the roles of some of these folks, but. Um, I'm assuming it's pretty close to real. He would have never come down if it, I think it's one of his sons turned him in because his son didn't know what was happening. And when he realized what was happening, he turned his father in. But he could have gone on a lot longer if somebody yeah. had said something about it because the uh, some of the regulators were either blind or purposely turning a blind eye to some of what was going on and 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 all the people that were benefiting from what he was doing that were his clients they were perfectly happy mm -hmm. but even some of them realized that it was too good to be true and if they had said something to somebody but they're not going to say something because they're getting lots of money out of it you know yeah so Really, I think Peterson is right when he says if there's one person who will speak the truth, this kind of stuff can't go on and yeah. it can't scale that big. If you speak the truth at the beginning when this thing starts happening, it can't scale like that. So we're all complicit because we're all willing to keep our mouths shut because we don't want to get injured. We don't want to lose our um, income stream. We don't want to lose our prestige in our community or whatever, you know, Um yeah <laughs> and then my husband and i are watching this series which is pretty hard to watch so we only watch like an episode every other week or something it's called dead to me which the whole thing is about somebody not telling the truth once at the beginning and then how that all plays oh, out wow. of not telling the truth and then what happens when you do tell the truth but it's a it's kind of a black comedy so yeah anyway I think this whole thing about speak the truth, at least don't lie is, is really one of the fundamental issues of what we're in right now. Yeah. And I think part of along with that is we need to have, we need to be better about encouraging those around us to speak the truth, because the thing is trying to do that takes a lot of courage. And um, we often disincentivize it by becoming we're, we're so like this technocracy where if someone tries to say something we like you know we look for all the things wrong in it and you know we we tear people down and you know it, it's something i'd like i wish we were better as a society at is is trying to kind of you know sort the wheat from the chaff in terms of like sometimes like like being better about looking about what is someone's intention here versus what, like whether how technically accurate they are or not, you know? Um, because I don't know. I think, I, I just feel like most people, they don't, there's not a lot of good examples, right. Of, of someone trying to do the right thing and maybe not doing it perfectly and everybody coming around going, okay, you know, 
helping out in some some way or form. Um, I, you know, I do think you know again this this little core of the internet. What's what's so encouraging about it is how people tend to encourage one another in that act. Like, okay, like you know, I disagree with what you're saying here, here, and here, but I, I understand like your efforts overall are you're trying to you're trying to speak the truth, right? And so I wanna I wanna like help encourage and call that out to um to some degree versus the like, oh, I'm gonna watch your whole video and I'm gonna tell you everything you did wrong. I think I think that can be helpful too. Be like, I mean, if I, you know, make a mistake about something that's factually incorrect, you know, it's you know, and you have somebody who's watching along and they tell you, that's great. You might you might learn something new. Um, but it's like, I don't know this sort of balance in terms of wanting to, to build up rather than tear down. Um, Cause I think you got, you, you have to do a bit of both all the time. And I, I feel like um, it's very hard to be the person that's, that's trying to, um, to go out on a limb and say what, what, you know, nobody wants to say. Um well, and the other side of that is how important, I mean, how important it is that we don't leave things in the fog. Yeah. Because if you leave it kind of uncertain, kind of tenuous, then you can you can get by with saying a lot of things, but you're not really saying anything and you're not really landing on something that could be conceived of as true or false or right or wrong because you're just sort of leaving it in the fog, which is a lot of what I I find myself doing that. Yeah, because it's safer. I see yeah. it a lot in the news. I see it a lot with talking heads. They say a lot of stuff that doesn't say anything. And uh, one of the things that Oz Guinness said in in his in his talk, well, I think it's a quote from one of his books, maybe, is that contrast is the mother of clarity. Mm. That and what he means by that is. Like one of the reasons that he thinks America is a great place, even though he he's not from here and he didn't grow up here is that he has seen the rest of the world. <laughs> and because he's had that opportunity to live other places where it is so, so, so much worse, then he can come here. He can see the good parts of this. He can see the bad parts of it too, but because he's had the contrast that's given him, given him clarity about what there is here. That's but, but I think that's a really great quote. Contrast is the mother of clarity you have to be able to see both ends of the spectrum in order to have any concept of what the truth is. Well, that makes me think um, too about all these, I, we, we were kind of emailing about this, but all these these uh, large language models and what they do and how they work with language. I mean, I, I'm really excited about these things. I think there's a lot of, they, they're tools that can be used in really powerful ways, I think, to, um, to help do things um but there one of the things they i i, I do worry about is that one thing they kind of do is they in the responses in the writing that they generate is is a sort of removing of contrast it's kind of like this sort of average of what people think mm. or like what the written text they've been trained on has towards a, a perspective on something which can kind of take all the 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 rough edges and all the kind of weirdness out of it there was uh an article in the uh, new york times uh, i don't know maybe like two three weeks ago something like that maybe longer um where they were like they basically were talking about okay can you it was like a test like can you tell which of these um these you know paragraphs of text were written by an actual human fourth or grader or eighth grader or something like that uh, and which ones were generated by, you know, chat GPT. Um, and I actually found it kind of easy to, to, to the, the article headline was like, oh, experts can't tell. I, I found it fairly easy. I mean, it was, it was kind of difficult. It's kind of scary how difficult it was, but for me, the way I could always tell, like, it was very easy to tell the human because they always had a certain, I don't know what it is. It's just, it's, it's a weirdness. It's like, it's like, there's, uh, uh, there's a sense of a perspective, like an actual unique perspective that you could kind of sense in any time the human, anytime the AI was writing, it always had this sort of, a sort of generic feel of like, anybody could have written this. Like it didn't have, you know, and, and the thing is like, I think in our time, we often 
especially the more higher up the ladder you are in terms of the um, social hierarchy, you you aspire to that kind of generic perspective, that view from nowhere, right? In terms of how you communicate, that's we prize that as a sort of mark of intellect and like refinement. But um, and so and from that perspective, like the the stuff that comes out of the AI can feel very like great because it feels very like uh towing the line between like keeping everything nice and balanced but even keeping it all nice and tidy and and short and crisp and you know does a very good job with that and it's very impressive but um yeah I, I do i do worry about it kind of crowding out all the people's willingness to to write and communicate and relate their their unique perspective that they have that i think is invaluable like i i think we don't we don't we don't do enough to tell people about um how um precious their own you know god-given you know uh, experiences in in life in in um in body and all the all the unique attributes that make you up we don't have a, i don't think we have a good sense of of that value for that We've lost some of that. Um, I think, in a certain sense, some of this stuff will will bring a will bring that back um, because I think we'll once we we get a steady diet of the other, like we'll say, hey, something's missing here. Like somebody's just taking all the salt off our food, um, and we'll we'll notice and and we'll we'll crave it. Um, but you really notice it in the poetry. I don't mm -hmm. know if you've seen what's been. Well, you're maybe not on Twitter these days, but. One of the things that's going around Twitter is people asking the thing to write a poem. Like uh -huh. um, they asked, they asked it to write a poem about one political figure and then the other political figure. And one political figure it refused to write a poem about because it said, "We don't do political stuff." But then the other political figure that's in their camp, they wrote this yeah, yeah. very flowery poem about. Okay, I'm not going to say which two political figures, but anyway. Mm -hmm. The, the poem that it did write about this political figure was so saccharine and sappy. But but one of the reasons that poetry is so idiosyncratic from a you know a person's personal perspective is it's very visceral. When mm -hmm. you write poetry, it's very much your your first person perspective comes through that. You, you know, no matter what you're even if you're just writing about the beauty of the trees or something, there is something that's coming out of you that's very um very personal and baked in through all your years of, of living in this world. But the stuff that this machine writes is, you know, anybody could toss it off. It's like roses are red, violets are blue, blah, 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 blah. And I love you. It's, it's that kind it's that level of stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's pretty funny. Well, we could go on all day, but you've got a hard stop at, at yeah. nine thirty. So, um, I appreciate you coming on in spite of the busyness of your life. And yeah, it was, it was, it was good um, chatting with you and yeah, we'll catching up a bit. And I will put in the, uh, in the uh, description section about the Oz Guinness video and also the James Lindsay video. I think they're both worth watching. There's, yeah. certainly, there's certainly differing views on the same problem. Yeah, I'd, I'd interested to hear other folks' uh, perspectives on the James Lindsay one because I think I, he's a really smart guy, but I, I think he that video is uh, not him at his best, unfortunately. Well, and you know maybe I should have a talk with Nate or somebody like that who's more knowledgeable about and and uh, Michael Martin. You, can, you should try and talk that. to James. Uh, he he does a lot of YouTube. You know, you might uh, might be able to talk to him as well. Like what. Uh, well, before I, I could I mean, talk maybe, maybe. to him, I'd have to know more myself about Gnosticism yeah. and Hermeticism, because those were the two things that, I mean, there are a lot of people in our corner that are talking about Hermeticism, mm -hmm. um, which is roughly connected to the alchemical stuff, I think. And Peterson has talked a lot about the alchemical stuff in regards to Jung, Jung's ideas. So, but I'd have to know a lot more about it before I could have a conversation with James to even flesh out what his understanding of it is. So I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I wouldn't. I mean, I think just, I think just even an interview where you're asking the questions would be interesting, but. 
Well, I'll put that out there for people. If they want me to talk to James Lindsay, send me some questions that I could ask him. <laughs> that would help. So have a great day, Michael. Yeah, you too. It's great talking to you. Yeah, bye-bye.